Now, granted, many of you are waking up, and this audience especially, you, you lead the pack. You're the best. But the sheep, when you go out and look at the masses, you know, we know, that maybe 1% of them gets it. Maybe I'm being too generous. Maybe it's a tenth of a percent who truly gets it. They know things are not good. They're afraid. They're full of anxiety. But they don't know what to do, and they're not going to do anything about it. And the controllers know this. Does that mean that we should quit? You should quit? No. We'll keep trying. There's always hope. That's one thing they can't take away from us. Jonathan Emord is back tonight, one of our great patriots, an attorney who has fought battles, many battles for all of us. Uh, he is on with us once a month, and we're grateful to have you back tonight, Jonathan. How are you? Just fine, Jeff. Good to be with you. All right. Now, we've got a number of things to talk about. Anything in specific you want to just make by way of a, a general quick statement? Where are we? Where are we? Well... We have, since the 1930s, increasingly relied upon the bureaucratic state to uh, run the country. And so as a consequence, here we are, particularly with Obamacare, they are hamstringing free enterprise and individual liberty in ways, as you pointed out, that are profound. Uh, we are rapidly losing our ability to defend ourselves against these actions. The courts have, for now uh, 80 years, rubber-stamped the administrative state so that uh, delegation by Congress of all manner of power to the regulatory state has not been held unconstitutional in a single instance since the late 1930s. And the administrative state is a law unto itself. It, it's unelected. It's unaccountable to the courts and the Congress and the American people. And its will is the principal uh, means by which individuals interact with the federal government, it's increasingly making irrelevant a Congress that will not take responsibility for the laws of the federal government and will not call into question the administrative state beyond lip service. And it's this precise thing that poses the greatest threat to individual liberty uh, in this country, and we increasingly look like Europe. In Europe, for example, just to give you a tiny example, it's emblematic of everything going on in Europe. The Danes discovered, much to their chagrin, over the Christmas holiday that the EU its regulation on baked goods prohibits uh, cinnamon that is more than 15 milligrams per kilo. And the reason why the EU did this is that uh, uh, there's, a, there's an ingredient in, which contains coumarin. And coumarin at very high dose levels, and I mean very high, 50 times uh, the level that the typical European consumes, uh, may, and I emphasize that word may, cause liver abnormalities. Based on that, the EU has banned Danish rolls so that the Norwegians who have been consuming it for to over 200 years, their entire baking industry is facing a shutdown one year from now for this ridiculous paternalism from the European Food Safety Authority. And this is uh, something that the FDA in this country is enamored of. The FDA finds the powers of the EU and the European Food Safety Authority extraordinary in a positive way. They wish that they could replicate all of them here, and they're doing a very good job of uh, copying uh, government fiat as the means of, of second-guessing individual freedom of choice. It's it, we, we never, you know, as a nation... At the start of our founding, uh, in the founding era of this country, we valued first and foremost individual liberty, freedom of choice, and we depended upon government, uh, for the purpose solely of protecting our individual liberties. That was the whole reason for, uh, ensconcing into the federal government the 
power to to create an army and to and to uh, uh, regulate commerce and to do all of the things that are a part of the Constitution. But one thing we knew, uh, the founders knew, was that even though they wished there to be enumerated powers delegated to the federal government to limit the power of the government, in 1793, shortly after the First Amendment was ratified, that by 1798, the Congress was already uh, creating a, a federal law of seditious libel in direct violation of the First Amendment. So the struggle has been with us since the origins of the country, but there's never been an onslaught against freedom like what we're experiencing now. And what's more, there's never been a degree of lawlessness, absence of the rule of law, total disregard of court orders, uh, denying the agency power to violate civil liberties, a president that is absolutely unwilling to abide by restrictions on his power in any way, and a regulatory state that views the federal courts as an inconvenience and nothing more. Uh, we've lost the basic principle upon which we depend for the protection, the legal protection of freedom, respect for the rule of law, most particularly respect for the plain and intended meaning of the Constitution. And that, uh, Jeff, is the great tragedy. We we will never overcome the problems that beset this nation, which all devolve into a uh, sapping of individual freedom of choice uh, until we we reestablish the Constitution of 1787, the Constitution of limited powers, protection for civil liberties and economic liberties equally, and... Um, Respect for free enterprise as a manifestation of liberty, not as a characteristic that is aberrant from uh, liberty. And those things are going to require a, a revolution of sorts. My own prediction is that the uncontrolled growth of the federal government, the promises of entitlements that abound and keep growing with Obamacare and other promises of an reestablishment of of the Great Society, for example, and Baines Johnson's social welfare program, that these things are going to collapse of their own weight, incapable of being financed and operated, and will look much like the end of the former Soviet Union. And then there will be the opportunity to reestablish free enterprise and reestablish our constitutional powers limits that we've abandoned. Words have been used so much now to try to describe the indescribable outrage that's going on that they're beginning to lose their clout. It's like we need a new lexicon to deal with this. It's in such uncharted territory. Well, when it's so prolific, when you have a scandal after a scandal after a scandal after a scandal, the public becomes numb. That That's part of their the game. Advantage. They, they know sure. that. Right, and... So you have the politics of denial. You have no integrity. Uh, people don't expect integrity anymore from those in government. They expect them to be to lack integrity. When a scandal arises, uh, people are, tend to say, "Oh well, you know, he's a politician. What do you expect?" Um, that, that's exactly what we don't want, <clears throat> but it's here. And then when it comes to um, good people in government, to people who are whistleblowers or People who are like John Sopko, who was the immediate former head of uh, the Inspector General for uh, the uh, Department of Defense dealing with Afghan reconstruction. Uh, he was a good man, and he uncovered all of this corruption, uh, waste uh, from the Department of Defense across the board, $34 million plus for a football-sized command facility that was never supposed to be built but is entirely vacant in southwestern Afghanistan half a billion dollars spent on 20 propeller transport aircraft that are inoperable, that are requiring another $200 million in order to make them fly. Yeah, and then uh, they're going to be junked out anyway. And yeah. They just sell and them off. It's, and it, it's this kind of profligate, uh, wasteful spending and lack of accountability that just boggles the mind. And 
you have politicians like Harry Reid standing up there and basically pleading that the budget is, 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 is to the bone. We can't afford to make cuts without sacrificing people. And at the same time, there are stories coming out of all the agencies of one action of corruption after another, resulting in uh, huge financial losses to taxpayers. But that's just part of the problem. The administrative state is literally chewing up the private sector and spitting it out. Uh, take, for example, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, for years, uh, people uh, perceived, a lot of people, legal people in the com legal community, perceived the FTC as uh, a judicious uh, user of its power to declare uh, something anti-competitive conduct or to declare something deceptive advertising. I was never one who believed that government ought to be in the business of uh, interfering with market processes unless there was uh, evidence of um, corruption, of illegality uh, that caused injury. Um, but today, on what they term implied claims, they'll go after a company and say, all right, you overtly represent X but you're yeah. implying why. Mm -hmm. And the implication of what you're saying is deceptive. You prove that the implication we say exists is not deceptive. This this Orwellian game uh, that is wholly flips the burden of proof under the First Amendment on its head. The First Amendment is to stand as a barrier against government, forcing the government to prove with empirical evidence, by clear and convincing evidence, that people are actually deceived. Under the present system, the FTC can presume that people are deceived without any evidence of that at all. And they can interpret language used in advertising to imply claims that they say deceive the American people. Mm -hmm. When there's no evidence of dissatisfaction, you can have uh, a company's product that is mm -hmm. celebrated in the marketplace. Right. And the FTC will declare the company to be engaged in deceptive advertising and will condemn that company draw it through a long, drawn-out administrative process that costs millions of dollars to defend. And the very party that is bringing the charges, the Federal Trade Commission itself, right. is the party that ultimately judges whether you're engaged in deceptive advertising. Well, this is, a uh, complete farce. This is... It's a farce, yeah, but it's worse than a farce because it's... It is... It is not a republic, a democracy, it is some other form of uh, of government. Here, U.S. President Barack Obama has called for, quote, a year of action, end quote, vowing to take measures into his own hands when necessary. During his weekly address, Obama said, quote, I'll keep doing everything I can to create new jobs and new opportunities for American families. With Congress, on my own, and with everyone willing to play their part. With Congress, on my own, and with everyone... This guy, is a, a, he is a dictator. He is, a, he is proclaiming a dictatorship in this country, and he is proclaiming himself active dictator. He will act on his own, he mocked the three-part system that we rely on to protect us. The executive, judicial, and legislative branches have been just thrown in the trash. This guy is uh, completely, totally out of control. It's going to require that people raise their heads and be counted in, in opposition to this. And unless there is to be a revolution which would be ruinous to lives and to property and to liberty and may invite dictatorial well, rule. A lot of people would die. this through the ballot box. Well, we can't. That's the catch-22. The ballot box well, is fixed. That may be. You may be right. I'm still hoping that we will be able to put into office people who uh, will re restore the republic yes, as the yes. population. Yes, my friend. I concur 100%. Unfortunately, the vetting process now requires most candidates, if not all, for national office from Congress on up to pass muster in terms of, let's just say,
powerful political action committees, special vested interest groups, and power brokers. And if you don't pass their test, you don't get campaign funds. And then you have to face the prospect of a 51-49 loss in the election. And we all know what a two-point loss in an election in all likelihood can contain. Fixed vote counts. So it's a very tough situation, and I, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a superb hour, and uh, I hope you're right. I, I really do.